my favorite coworker. <laughs> Heidi, you're in for a treat because she loves murder podcasts, <laughs> bearded dragons, anyone else? Black licorice? <laughs> really? People are like, oh yeah. <laughs> Very polar. Pugs, corgis, trivia contests, but there's a lot more. I dubbed her last night a passionista. Not a fashionista, but you're that too. A uh, passionista for bringing others along on this journey to transforming to better reading instruction. We know when we know better, we do better, all of us. And these people, like include yourself who come here, you know a lot. Everyone knows a lot, and there's always room to learn more. It's exciting. Uh, you're in for a treat because Dr. Heidi is articulate, concise, very exacting in her wording. Every word and each sentence is there for a reason, right? I'm not going anywhere bad with this. You don't have to squint at me. <laughs> she's frank, and she's never going to mince a word because she has such high regard for the profession of teaching, and especially teaching reading. So tonight you're going to hear about the three queuing systems. Last night uh, we had a lot of students. Any students in here t tonight from wonderful things? Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, from when I taught, uh, the students might not have ever heard of the three queuing systems, but likely they have seen or will see lots of pra practices and programs aligned with the three queuing systems, uh, featuring the three queuing, as all of us do. So without further ado, let's hear about it. <laughs> Heidi. All right. Dr. Heidi. Hi. Getting a little ahead of myself already. Who's heard of the queuing systems, the three queuing systems? Yes? That's, I think, pretty much everybody. But I will tell you that the last grad course I taught, there were, I think, 12 or 13 people in it. And that's one of the questions that I ask in the beginning. And I say, raise your hand if you've heard about the three queuing systems. And for the first time ever, nobody raised their hand. So I consider that progress. I think that's a good step in the right direction. Here's the catch, though. Sometimes we don't call it the three queuing systems. And its spirit lives on in materials, practices, approaches that are very common in classrooms. So that is something that we need to think about. It's not always explicitly called the three queuing systems. It might be called something else. Um, sometimes instruction that is grounded in the three queuing systems is strategic. Sometimes it's balanced literacy. Okay, a lot of things get done in the name of balanced literacy. It's kind of a nice way to name anything, right? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. We'll talk more about it. These are the questions we're going to explore tonight. Uh -huh. So there it is. There's the beast. <laughs> Raise your hand high if you've seen something like this before. Okay. I'm going to click again and something's going to happen. So according to the logic of the three queuing systems, each of these areas contributes to reading, which happens in the middle where the star is. That's the sweet spot. That's where the magic happens. Okay. So it's an interesting idea, and it is one that makes some intuitive sense if you don't know how reading works, right? I think about the meanings. I think about the structure of the language. I look at what's on the page and how the words look. It's a decent attempt to try to explain it if we don't know better. Well, in the 1970s-ish is where this really started to gain some traction. It was at the height of a movement called whole language. Heard of that? Yeah. So the idea behind whole language was that reading and writing are natural processes, and that just like speaking and listening, we will be able to learn to read and write without explicit instruction. We now have over 40 years of research to support that that is not a correct idea. Okay? 
Therefore, we also have 40 years of research to support that this really isn't how word reading works, yet it lives on, sometimes very explicitly looking like this, and sometimes a little bit more hidden, all right? What we know is that the brain is hardwired for speech and language. We will, barring any other difficulties, generally learn how to speak and listen without explicit instruction. However, reading and writing is a relatively new phenomenon, and we are not hardwired in our brains to read and write naturally. It's something that needs to be taught. And what we know from 40 years of research is that explicit instruction in how that works is a lot more effective than incidental instruction or a constructivist uh, discovery approach to how reading works. So in order to provide instruction that is explicit about how reading works, we as teachers have to understand how reading works, right? Make sense? Does that make sense? <laughs> that was not planned. All right. So you may have heard of the three queuing systems in terms of semantic, syntactic, and graphophonic or graphophonemic. Those are switched up sometimes. You may have heard of the three queuing systems in terms of MSV or meaning structure visual. We'll talk a little more about that visual moniker later on. Not, not very helpful to think about that as visual, right? Um, in a little bit, we'll be talking more about what the science tells us, but it is problematic that that is called visual. Um, you'll see prompts when kids hit a word that they don't know. What do we say to those kids to try to solve that word? What would make sense, right? What would make sense? Does it sound right? And then finally, does it look right? So there are products out there and posters. Does it sound right? Does it make sense? Does it look right? Those reflect a grounding in the three queuing systems. All right. Yes, we want our reading to make sense. Reading is supposed to make sense. Yes, we want our reading to sound right. Mm -hmm. These are outcomes that we want. Does it look right? Well, I mean, it should look right. I don't, I, I don't really know where to go with that one. Uh, but what we do know is that this bottom circle here is on the bottom for a reason. When this diagram became popular, during the time of whole language, which is still alive and well under many names, the graphophonic, graphophonemic, or visual cueing system was portrayed as minimally important. In fact, oftentimes, teachers were taught, and kids, therefore, were also taught, that the letters on the page don't really matter that much. What really matters is the meaning. And does it sound right? And that we can over-rely on the words when reading. Now, I want you to think about that. <laughs> over-relying on the words that are on the printed page. Something to think about. On your knowledge sheet, you have this diagram, and then below it, you have some space. So I know that there are many iterations of this diagram floating around in the world. And I invite you to draw a little sketch of the one that you're familiar with. Maybe it has four. Sometimes pragmatics gets in there. Did anybody ever learn four queuing systems? Yeah. So take a minute, turn and talk about the diagram that you know, and I would also like for you to talk about where you learned about the three queuing systems and what did you understand it to mean for your teaching. Go ahead, take a few minutes.
All right. Moving on. Does this ring a bell for anybody? Raise your hand high if you've listened to Emily Hanford's audio documentary, At a Loss for Words, how a flawed idea is teaching millions of kids to be poor readers. Guess what that flawed idea is? The three queuing systems. Yeah. Yeah. So hands up if you listen to Emily's first audio documentary, Hard Words. All right, hands up again for at a loss for words. Excellent. If you have not heard these, I absolutely recommend them. Emily Hanford has been incredibly valuable in getting the message to circles outside of education circles about how important it is to teach reading in ways that are aligned with the evidence base rather than in ways that are aligned with ideology, popular materials, slick marketing, what the school down the street is doing, right? All right. We're just super grateful to her in, in the uh, reading research community. Emily is also going to be a keynote speaker at our conference. Anybody coming to the conference? Yeah, I see you there. So I'm really excited. I'm, I'm kind of fangirling about this. I haven't met Emily yet. I've talked to her on the phone before, but I'm kind of, right? Because I listened to her in the car, and if you saw me driving down the street listening to Emily's docs, you would think I was listening to Motley Crue. I'm just like, yeah! <laughs> you know, driving down the street. It's amazing. I love you, Emily. Okay. I got to go. This is going on YouTube. <laughs> okay. All right. Where did this thing come from? Well, we don't really know. If you listen to Emily's documentary, uh, she heads down the Goodman path, which is absolutely a viable path. Um, we'll talk about him in a minute. I am going to take you on the journey that Marilyn Adams took when she started to hear about the three queuing systems and started wondering, where the heck is this thing coming from? I am a cognitive and developmental psychologist, not me, Marilyn Adams. <laughs> She's thinking, I'm a cognitive and developmental psychologist who specializes in reading. She's made tremendous contributions to the field, and she's never heard of this. And she was embarrassed when teachers were like, oh, the three queuing systems, and she's like, what are you talking about? So it, it's, it's kind of a neat story. But before I can get into that, I have to share with you the message that Adams was trying to bring to teachers in the early 90s, which has to do with the fact that kids absolutely 100% need code-based instruction so that they can get the words off the page with accuracy and efficiency. Why? Because that is the best path to comprehension. Of course the goal of reading is to comprehend. We know from 40 plus years of research that the best way to get to comprehension is to have seemingly effortless decoding or getting those words off the page, word recognition. Right? And Marilyn Adams was out doing PD to tell folks about it. I'm just going to show you one of her landmark books on the dot cam. Okay, this is Marilyn Yeager Adams. Ooh, close your eyes, don't get sick. Move it up. Okay, beginning to read. Okay. I'm going to show you one other book. This is a book called Literacy for All, and chapter four is written by Adams. And it's called The Three Queuing Systems. <laughs> and she wrote about her journey. And she also features a bunch of diagrams of different iterations of the queuing systems that she's encountered. Okay, this is, um, I'll show you if you're snapping pictures. Okay. Okay. 
I want to tell you that there's no such thing as a phonics-only person. I don't think these people exist anyway. Um, you know, I'll be on Twitter or something sometimes, and I'll hear folks put down, well, it, it can't just be phonics only, and what are they calling them? Fombies, like zombies, right? So now we have insults for people who believe that phonics instruction is important. Um, it's really unfortunate, because I just can't imagine anyone thinking that phonics only is, is the path to being a good reader. No, it's not phonics only, but it's phonics early, and it's phonics really, really well. Because that makes the decoding work take up very little cognitive energy and frees up a lot of space for comprehension and critical thinking, which is all part of that far more to literacy development than getting the words off the page. In the early 90s, Adams was sending this message to teachers. Okay. I am going to stop for a moment here, and I'm going to read you some of her work because it's just so beautiful. <laughs> it's a little bit lengthy, but I am going to ask you to turn and talk about it after. This is 1998. Poorly developed word recognition skills are the most pervasive and debilitating source of reading difficulty. Words, as it turns out, are the raw data of text. I love that. It is the words of a text that evoke the starter set of concepts and relationships from which its meaning must be built. Research has shown that for skillful readers, and regardless of the difficulty of the text, the basic dynamic of reading is the line by line, left to right, and word by word. It is because skillful readers are able to recognize words so quickly that they can take text in at rates of approximately five words per second, or nearly a full typewritten page per minute. It is because their capacity for word recognition is so overlearned and effortless that it proceeds almost automatically, feeding rather than competing with comprehension processes. Most surprising of all, research tells us that what enables this remarkably swift and efficient capacity to recognize words is the skillful reader's deep and ready knowledge of words spellings and spelling to speech correspondences. During that fraction of a second that the eyes are paused on any given word of a text, its spelling is registered with complete letter-wise precision, even as it is instantly and automatically mapped to the speech patterns it represents. Although scientists are only beginning to understand the various roles of these speech spelling to speech translations, they are clearly of critical importance to the reading process. Moreover, research affirms that except as children have internalized the spelling to speech correspondences of the language, learning to recognize an adequate number of words with the speed and accuracy on which fluent reading depends is essentially impossible. Turn and talk, please. How does that square up with your understanding of three queuing system logic? <laughs> so as Adams went around doing PD with teachers, they started showing her this diagram. And she looked at it and said, eh, this must, she interpreted it as these are the things that you need to comprehend text. And it is. That is what you need to comprehend text but it's not the way that the reading works, right? Those are two different things. And she soon found that the three queuing systems logic that the teachers had, those understandings, were coming into conflict with her trying to share this message grounded in what I just shared with you. Because the teachers that she talked to would produce this diagram and explain it to her that all of these things need to be used together, but that that graphophonic piece, which is l 
arguably the piece that she's talking about is being of primacy, right, of, of critical importance, is we should minimize that. It's on the bottom for that reason. That also puzzled her because a Venn diagram, it doesn't matter where the circle is placed. The logic is only about the amount of space that's overlapped, right? Being placed on the bottom, if they're all overlapping equally, it doesn't matter which circle is named what. So interesting interpretations of this had come up. But then she found that it was getting in the way. Adams came up with two critical misunderstandings that were perpetuated um, by the queuing systems. One was that the graphophonic system should be subordinated. And the other was that um, semantics and syntactics just kind of happen. Uh, she found that when she talked with teachers, about reading instruction and about the three queuing systems, there was very little talk about how to teach vocabulary, how to teach uh, background knowledge, which are critical, how to teach grammar and acceptable word order, right? So if we think about semantics, an example that she uses is she gets good grades because she loves school versus she loves school because she gets good grades. Do both of those make sense? Do both of those look right? Do both of those sound right? Yeah. But let's think about it. Syntax is more than just having the wrong part of speech in a spot in a sentence. Syntax is about ordering words to show the relationship between ideas and actions. So again, a superficial discussion would ensue about how, okay, if we're not supposed to really pay attention to this graphophonemic part, how do we pay attention to this upper part? she decided she needed to find out where this came from. So, yes, in the 90s we had the internet. And she went on to some listservs and, I don't know, chat room? I don't even know, some forums, and put out, <laughs> I, do you remember chat rooms? All right, I, I never went on chat room. And these are some of the possible sources that came up. All right. This is just an example. So Emily Hanford dives deep on Goodman and has some really interesting quotes. She was able to talk to Ken and Yetta Goodman. So again, I encourage you to take a listen to that. Uh, but it seems that Ken Goodman was as early as 1970, the first one to be talking about reading in terms of semantic, syntactic, and graphophonic cueing systems, right? And then a lot of folks pointed to Routman as being where they learned about it. Uh, Routman had two books. I know Invitations in particular was pretty popular as a textbook in the 90s for teacher preparation. Okay. The diagram does appear in both of these books, but Routman doesn't talk about Goodman. She doesn't attribute the diagram or the queuing systems to Goodman at all. She points to Holdaway, who is Australian, and I'll show you that book over here. I mean, that's from 1979. She points to him as her inspiration for how she talks about reading and the cueing systems in her book. And I will tell you that Holdaway's value for the graphophonic system, I'll show you this book. This is 
was not favorable. <laughs> okay. I'm going to give you the next two slides to read some quotes from this book published by Heinemann. It's on the dot cam. Okay. This is Routman. I apologize, these quotes are from Transitions. I'm going to go ahead a slide and have you read a little bit more. This quote is from Invitations. The other bullets are about Invitations. Okay. Now I'm going to show you those again. Here are the quotes from Transitions. And here are the quotes from Invitation. I want you to take a moment to turn and talk about how that squares up with A, Adam's message that she's trying to share with teachers, and the three queuing systems logic as you understand it. Go ahead. I'll keep flipping back and forth. Okay, let's come back together. Some spirited discussion here, yes? All right. Well, this just gives us a historical perspective and a lot to think about. So I think we can agree that, yeah, folks that were promoting the three queuing systems we're minimizing the primacy of that sound symbol relationship piece, of that alphabetics piece, of the whole getting the words off the page piece. But how did it get perpetuated? If we have 40 plus years of research saying this is flawed, how did it get perpetuated? Well, we're going to examine that. I don't know if we'll answer it completely. But I know it wasn't Tim Shanahan. <laughs> because here's what he has to say about it. A teacher asked, why don't you ever write about the three queuing systems? And that's his response. I love it. So we can check him off the list. It's not his fault. Thank you, Tim. Let's see what Kilpatrick has to say about it. I mean, he just says it's been impervious to the research, right? No matter how much the research comes at it, it comes back 10 times harder. It has been ubiquitous in teacher preparation, in school professional development, and in teacher culture for a good 25, 30 years, right? And what Kilpatrick also says is that um, a lot of that research on explicit instruction does directly pit it against things that could be categorized as whole language balanced literacy or uh, strategic three queuing systems oriented instruction because that is generally the flavor of business as usual in a school. 
schools really are dominated by these kinds of practices, right? It's not their fault. Hempenstall is next. Poor Carrie Hempenstall. <laughs> He's been trying to slay this beast for a good two decades. Will it ever go away? He says, I'm watching Rachel's like, will it ever go away? Yeah, so this is just a sampling of his writing about the three queuing systems. Here's Seidenberg, right? So he has this apt description of it being carried on like a game of telephone just kind of passed along and passed along. Seidenberg talks about how, yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense. If you don't know any better and you don't have access to the scientific research and somebody puts this diagram in front of you and says, see, this is how this works, and yeah, okay, I buy it. Why not? seems somewhat intuitive. We can all get behind it. But we know better. We do know better. So we have to do better. Okay. Sherman and Ramsey. They have a book called The Reading Glitch. I'll put that up for a sec. Okay. How the culture wars have hijacked reading instruction and what we can do about it. This is interesting because it tackles the issue of how politics seems to map on to folks' views about reading instruction. I'm gonna take that away. Um, that doesn't, it, it, this I still don't understand. Um, it seems if you are in schools and talking about systematic explicit instruction, folks who are pro systematic explicit instruction tend to be seen as conservative leaning, whereas folks who talk about constructivism or discovery learning seem to be seen as more liberal leaning. Raise your hand if that's kind of been your experience. Yeah, or, yeah. I don't understand it. I really don't. Um, in fact, it seems opposite to other things that we try to map on to political affiliation, right? Like evolution. We tend to think of evolution as being accepted by more liberal leaning people and rejected by more conservative leaning people, right? In that situation, it's conservatives who are anti science, but in reading, it's the Liberals who are anti-science? And what about climate change? I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, how, this, how this happens, I don't know. Uh, the reading glitch sheds a little bit of light on it. But I think in the end, regardless of your political affiliation, <laughs> If we have 40 years of evidence to back something up, as important as how to make kids as literate as possible, shouldn't we all want that? Isn't that like the definition of social justice? Making sure that all kids can be as literate as possible so they can access as much information as they can and express themselves. Again, just another interesting thing to think about. All right, so I guess we haven't answered the question about how it's been perpetuated yet, but it sure shows up a lot in, in uh, handouts at professional development experiences and uh, in binders coming out of graduate and undergraduate coursework. Um, so 
moving on from that, I guess I'll just talk about me, me, me. Let's talk about me. All right, I can't walk that way. I gotta walk this way. So I will tell you that in the mid-1990s, I was an undergraduate. And in the mid-1990s, I learned how to do running records and MISQ analysis. Raise your hand high if you learned how to do running records and MISQ analysis. Okay. I was really good at it. I remember a lot of readings that had to do with Mari Clay. I remember reading about queuing systems. I can't say that I remember seeing the diagram. I may have, but I don't remember it from my undergraduate. Uh, but I do remember doing the MISQ analysis. I do not remember learning anything about um, language structures or phonics or phonological awareness. Now this is mid-1990s. I will tell you that this program, in the meantime, <laughs> between then and now, has changed and those, those same teachers need to teach 10 phonics lessons during their teacher preparation courses and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, at the time, zip, zero, zilch for undergrad. And then I went on and took my master's path as a reading specialist. And I learned more about Miss Q analysis. I saw the diagram for the, <laughs> I remember seeing the diagram being drawn. I remember seeing it in some books about the three queuing systems. I remember in particular this big fat book by Constance Weaver which I'm gonna show you in a moment. And I remember explicitly getting the message that phonics is bad. <laughs> right? And there you can see a direct quote from the Weaver text. I also wanna show you this from the Weaver text. Looks like my bookmark came out, but I will find it. Clearly, there are many reasons for not teaching phonics relationships intensively and systematically. That is followed by a list of 13 reasons why we should not be teaching phonics explicitly. This was a textbook that I had in graduate school certifying me by the state of New York to be a reading specialist for children in kindergarten through 12th grade. Okay. Let's see. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make this show up. It's not necessary. I just wanted to show you my fingernails. <laughs> That's the only reason I'm doing this. All right, I'm gonna take this away and just read you the parts. Um, 13 reasons why we should not teach phonics. It's not necessary. Not all visual information is equally important. There are too many rules and patterns. Proficient readers don't process words letter by letter. Yes, they do. Duffy, I see you, yes. <laughs> Proficient readers use prior knowledge and context along with visual cues. The poor readers do when trying to identify words. That's what the poor readers do, okay? Um, too much emphasis on phonics encourages students to sound it out. Overemphasizing word identification may encourage readers to focus too much on getting words and too little on constructing meaning. How do you construct the meaning without getting the words? I, that's, I just love the Adams idea that words are the raw data of reading comprehension. Overemphasizing word identification may encourage readers to focus too much on getting words and too little on constructing meaning. You know, and it just goes on and on. Children 
learn to read naturally in the home, blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, here's, here's one that's particularly egregious. Ready? Children who have had less extensive experiences with literacy and books prior to school may be especially disadvantaged by programs that teach phonics intensively and systematically. Turn and talk. <laughs> How does this square up with what Adams is trying to tell us? Bring your thoughts back together. Mm -hmm. And so I went on teaching for nine years using the three queuing systems until I had a baby and the time was right to cut my household income in half because diapers are free. Uh, I, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I decided this would be a good time to take up doctoral studies because how much time could that really take away from motherhood? <sighs> and I found Hogwarts. I did. Y'all know Hogwarts? Okay, good. I started my doctoral coursework for a PhD in reading education. I knew that what I was doing wasn't working as well as it should, considering the amount of emphasis that, is, that was put on the kind of practice that I was doing. I mean, yeah, kids would make some progress, but not nearly enough, um, especially, you know, my honeys who really struggled. And I tried to, you know, during that time, I. I subscribed to a research journal because I thought that might help me. But then I realized I couldn't read research articles because I didn't know what a multiple hierarchical regression was or how that affected my teaching. Um, so that didn't work out so well. On my first day of my doctoral work, I walked into a doctoral seminar with Dr. Benita Blackman called The Cognitive Psychology of Reading. I walked in, I sat at a table. There, that day, at that table, I met now Dr. Maria Murray, now Dr. Michelle Duffy, now Dr. John Preston. Anybody else in the room? Chris Munger, are you here? No? She's upstairs. Hi, Chris. Okay. And one of the first things that happened on that first night in the class was Dr. Benita Blackman. I didn't know I was supposed to do that because I'd never really heard of her at that point. <laughs> it's a sad state, right? Um, the first thing she had us do was go around and introduce ourselves and say what, how we understood reading to work. Do you remember? Guess who was first? this guy. So I looked Benita Blackman in the eye and I straightened my shoulders and I confidently said, well, you see, there are these three queuing systems. And I went through the whole thing. Do you remember? You don't remember that part? I hope she doesn't. You blocked it out. Right? And she sat there and very polite with her posture and her sweet voice and, uh-huh, mm-hmm, yeah, okay, uh -huh. and, and Maria, <laughs> and 
And then it was Maria's turn. And Maria introduced herself and then started talking about the connectionist model. <laughs> and then I went to Munger, who started talking about dual root theory. Right? And I don't remember what Duffy said. I know, I know Preston said something about phonemes. <laughs> I'm sure it was brilliant. But the point is, I went home and cried. <laughs> and I told my husband, I'm quitting. Oops, <laughs> do over. I can't hack this, I'm not smart enough. They know all this stuff, I don't know it. And he's like, no, you just cut our family income in half. You're, you're, we have a plan now and you can stick to it. I'm like, yeah, I guess I better, all right? But because of that class, I was introduced to the science of reading. And it was exactly what I felt like I was missing all this time. That uh, the imprecision of what I had been doing, the quest for wanting to know more and wanting my kids to achieve and being able to provide really effective instruction and not have things be so fuzzy, everything started coming into focus because I learned about the cognitive psychology of reading. Here's the kicker. It was an elective. So even in a terminal degree in reading education, it is possible and does happen that folks can come out being Dr. So-and-so in reading education and not knowing about the science of reading. Something's broken. Something is broken. Right? And here we are in 2019, and in my work with schools, I continue to encounter three queuing systems explicitly or implicitly all the time. All the time. So I guess Carrie Hempenstahl is going to have to keep writing. <laughs> I don't know, maybe we're making a dent in it though, right? Because that last crew of grad students I had had never heard of it. What's that? Well, yeah, this group, sure. All right. And while <laughs> it persists, kids aren't achieving the levels of literacy that they should be. And people are making money off of this. We know better. We have to do better. Well, what does the evidence say? Okay. So Seidenberg is very gracious, and he starts out with talking about what the diagram gets right. And again, it's, it's this whole idea that, yes, these are all things that are necessary for reading comprehension, but this is not the way that reading works, particularly that whole thing about the words part being basic and foundational and not super important. Basic and foundational and not super important are not synonyms, right? It's basic and foundational because it's super important. Right? So yeah, it gets some ideas right about how comprehension works but not about how the reading process works. We have three large scale reports, inquiries if you will, that have been completed by the United States, Australia, in the UK that look at hundreds, thousands of studies about reading. And the big thing that each and every one of those found every single time was that kids need systematic, explicit instruction in all areas of reading. But I want to emphasize phonics and phonological awareness here 
simply because tonight is about looking at the three queuing systems, and within that queuing systems theory, the graphophonic or graphophonemic queuing system is the one that is less than. And really, we know that we can't get to reading comprehension if we can't get those words off the page that the author put there for a reason. Right? So, Caroline Bowen and Pam Snow are from Australia. Pam Snow will be at our conference. She'll be doing a session on um, pseudoscience, so that should be interesting. Yeah. So how does the reading thing work? Right? If that diagram is no good, what does work? Well, I'm going to tell you that this is a very oversimplified diagram. All right? You have it on your knowledge sheet with a reference, Seidenberg and McClellan, 1989. This diagram was originally conceived before we had the fMRI studies. Now, they had done tons of scientific research in cognitive psychology to come up with this model. And then eventually we had some fMRI studies that showed, hey, guess what? It's pretty accurate. <laughs> so that's kind of neat. Um, just a reminder that the brain is hardwired for speaking and listening, not reading and writing. All right. When we take a look at these processors, I'd like you to remember that the orthographic processor is not like an organ that you can take out and hold the orthographic processor in your hand, right? It's an area. It's an area of the brain. The orthographic processor is responsible for processing orthography. <laughs> so what is orthography? Orthography is the written form of a language, of a spoken language. Okay. So we, in English, have an alphabetic orthography. We have symbols that represent sounds. We have 26 symbols that represent 44 sounds. Some orthographies are more shallow, like a one-to-one -one correspondence. Ours has a little more depth to it than that, hence the 26 symbols and 44 sounds, right? But it's generally pretty phonetically regular. We have an area of the brain that processes sounds. Phonological processor processes speech sounds. In order to read, the brain has to learn through explicit instruction, optimally, right? How to connect these two areas, how to build neural networks that associate the orthographic representations of letters with the sounds in speech that they represent. Guess what that's called? And we have to start here. These two purple guys <laughs> help us build what is primally important for reading comprehension. If we cannot get the accurate words off the page with relative ease, it is going to impede our reading comprehension. We want to make sure that these neural circuits are built well. We want them to be efficient and we want them to be accurate. All right? So let's say that I show you the word run on a card and say, don't read this. What's going to happen? You're going to read it. You can't not read it. I can't show you most English, basic English words and say, don't read this. It's going to happen because that word has been orthographically mapped. All right? You have that word accessible in your sight vocabulary. And you're going to see that term come up a little bit later. I just want to have a disclaimer here that when we say sight vocabulary, we mean words that have been orthographically mapped. For an explainer on orthographic mapping, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch Maria Murray's video. 
She has a great one that talks about orthographic mapping. If you want to take a real deep dive into orthographic mapping, look into David Kilpatrick's work. Um, his Essentials book would be a really great one to look at. All right. I don't mean words that have been sent home on a ring on index cards and flash carded to death. All right. I don't mean memorizing the Dolch and the Fry list. That's not what I mean by site vocabulary. I mean a word that has been orthographically mapped, a word that you can't not not read. Did I do the knots right? Okay, good. So say I show you the word run. These two processors are going to talk to each other. You have no control. <laughs> they're, going to, they're going to come up with the word run. And that speech center of your brain <laughs> that activates when you say the word run is going to activate even though you're not saying it. Isn't that cool? Right? And then very quickly, all of this happens in under a second, milliseconds, your brain is going to have kind of a drop down menu for all of the definitions for the word run. So turn and talk. How many different meanings for run can you come up with? Go ahead. <laughs> Run for president. Run in your a run in your stockings. Running a test on someone. A run, like a good run on the slot machines, right? What isn't there like a piano, like a run? Yeah. Last night somebody said run DMC. <laughs> right? So all of these things are almost instantly activated. But here's the deal. You can't activate that meaning piece for that word until you get the word, right? We can't start with meaning. So if we go back to that first question of, for when kids hit a word that they don't know, and we tell them, can you think of a word that would make sense? That's backwards. Yes, the goal is meaning, but we can't start with meaning. We have to start down here. And then both the orthographic processor and the phonological processor can give information that activates meaning. But we can't start there. And then if you're just reading words on a list or words on a card, it ends there. If you're reading in context, then your brain chooses that definition, the meaning, that makes sense. It all happens in under a second. Pretty cool, right? For more about that, you can check out uh, this Seidenberg book. Uh, I'll just hold it up for you. It was up there a minute ago. Mark Seidenberg, Language at the Speed of Sight, How We Read, Why So Many Can't, and What Can Be Done About It. Now, Kilpatrick has some things to say about difficulties with the three queuing systems. Criticisms, if you will. So here's how I've arranged these next few slides. The critical difficulty, number one, is outlined as a fact that doesn't jive with queuing systems, all right? So it is a fact that skilled word recognition does not require context. You know that because you can read the word run on a piece of paper or you could read a list of unrelated words. Right? And you can do that skillfully. There's no context there. Right? There are literally hundreds upon hundreds of studies that demonstrate that skilled readers are instantly and effortlessly able to recognize words when presented in isolation. That is a hallmark of a skilled reader. These are a few references um, that are reviews of that literature. Okay. Difficulty number two, guessing. I'll let you take a look. 
contextual guessing is something that is encouraged when we talk about the queuing systems. It's also one of those things that comes up when we see those lists, what, to get do, what do you do when you get stuck on a word? Skip it, read on, go back, what would make sense, right? So guessing from context is something that poor readers do. It's a compensatory strategy. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But using context to recognize words, to solve words, using context to solve words is only accurate 25 to 35% of the time. Is that good enough? Is it? It's not. We don't want the good enough guess. We want the word. Whereas if kids are equipped for reading success, <laughs> David, you up there? I don't know. If kids are equipped with the knowledge that they need, um, phonetic decoding is going to result in about 90% accuracy. That's a little better, right? So if we teach kids to guess from context, we're teaching them the habits of poor readers, and we're teaching them strategies that will only work for them up to 35% of the time. Mm -hmm. All right. Again, another comment on poor readers, not skill re skilled readers, rely heavily on the context. So here's where we talk about sight vocabulary a little bit. Kids who have a limited sight vocabulary are not the kids who didn't go home and practice their sight words on their ring with their index cards. Okay, that's not what I mean by sight vocabulary. I mean, these are the kids who don't recognize a lot of words immediately when they see them, either because they haven't had explicit instruction that results in orthographically mapping a lot of words, or because something else is going on with that child that we need to look into. Okay? And if you have a child who has limited sight vocabulary, right, so they don't recognize a lot of words instantly because they've had instruction that leads to orthographic mapping. And if you have kids who also are not good at sounding out words, either because something's going on or because they haven't had adequate instructional opportunity, you are going to have kids who compensate. Compensating might be good in some areas of life. Not in reading. Not in reading, because we know that we can teach up to 95% or more of kids to read. I go bananas when I sit in CSE meetings, and I hear people report on kids' current levels and progress, and they say, well, they struggle with decoding, but they have great compensatory strategies. And it, like it's a celebration, like it's a good thing. It's not. Kids shouldn't have to compensate. That's harder. It's easier for them to just read. But we can't teach them how to do that <laughs> unless we have the knowledge as the educators, right? So thanks for coming tonight and for all the other things that you do to build your knowledge. That's the best way we're going to be able to help kids. All right. Uh, David says, instead of making the kids jump over the hurdles, we should be taking the hurdles out of their way. Oh, remember this from the Hanford audio documentary? The good miscues? Yeah. Right? So semantic errors are not a sign of better reading. Um, just because an error doesn't change the meaning doesn't mean it should go ignored. That doesn't mean the child is a better reader. 
more on that when we get to MISQ analysis. And David Kilpatrick also, also talks about syntax and how syntax really isn't related to word reading at all. Okay. So I will have people ask me sometimes, well, what about kids who struggle? Like, I've tried this, I've tried that. Why don't we just show them the three queuing systems, ask them those questions, show them those strategies, because you know, it's easier, and they may be able to have more success with that. Well, Seidenberg reminds us that kids who struggle tend to have trouble integrating multiple sources of information. So why would we teach them from an approach that's very imprecise and requires attention to a number of things at the same time? doesn't seem to make sense. Okay. Three queuing systems approaches are particularly ill-advised for kids who struggle. Yet, people are making lots of money selling products that are grounded in the three queuing systems and marketed directly toward those kids who struggle the most. And we're going to start at the top, kind of from the 10,000 foot view. All right. This is a chart that I found in a letters manual. Letters is L-E-T-R-S, Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. It is a teacher knowledge curriculum. Right? It's, not a, it's not a program for children. It's a teacher knowledge building curriculum. And I got their permission. They were kind enough to let me recreate this table for you uh, because I think it's a really quickie, quickie way to sort of look at these areas and look across and say, are my beliefs and practices more in line with three queuing systems, or cognitive science? Or is the teacher prep program that I'm in right now more in line with three queuing systems or cognitive science? Or does the cultural practice in my school align more with three queuing systems or cognitive science? I'm going to give you a moment to read through that and to turn and talk. I know a lot of you are with colleagues from the same buildings and same districts. I'm not going to ask you to share out or collect anything, but this is a way to start getting your head in this space. Go ahead. those thoughts. Okay. Just a tool to help you reflect. Maybe you have folks you want to share this with back at your universities or back at school. So here's another big picture thing of what are the implications for practice. It has to do with neural circuitry. Now, Dr. Ken Pugh of the Haskins Lab in Yale was a keynote speaker in the spring of 2018 at Syracuse University's annual Neuroscience Research Day. Amazing, amazing opportunity. I went, it was awesome. In the audience were neuroscience people, 
right? So neuroscience doesn't just study reading, they study all kinds of things. But the keynote happened to be Ken Pew, so I'm in. Um, I was disappointed to not see more people in higher ed in our community that deal with reading at that event. But I was really excited to see a principal, a special education director, and a small group of teachers at a table. And I watched Ken Pugh, and I listened to Ken Pugh, and he's talking about glutamate and choline. <laughs> and I don't know what the heck he's talking about. Right? I mean, maybe a little bit. But I watched the teachers and the administrators just, just trying, you know? Like, really want to, and it, and it came to a point where somebody finally asked, so what, is it, what does this mean for my teaching? And, you know, because I'm kind of shy, <laughs> I spoke up and I said, you know, here's what I think is going on. And, and we had this nice dialogue. Um, John Preston, are you still in the room? John brought him here. Um, so thank you for that because this was a really powerful moment for me. Um, we had this dialogue that resulted in this, right? These are not direct quotes, but this is what came out of that conversation. Now, Ken Pugh is a neuroscientist, not a reading teacher, but the work that he does could have a tremendous impact on the practices of a reading teacher and ultimately the literacy achievement of our children. And what came out was this whole idea that we have efficient neural circuitry that needs to be built via explicit instruction. And it's pretty much the same for everyone, right? We don't really learn to read differently. We all have to do pretty much the same things in pretty much the same ways. And we want to build this effective, efficient neural circuitry for reading. We know that the best way to do this is with systematic explicit instruction in all the areas of reading. We also know that we kind of tend to poo-poo the phonics end of things. So we want to build that up for sure, right? We also know that if we teach reading in ways that encourage kids to guess and use other habits of poor readers, we are undermining the development of that neural circuitry for effective reading and building ineffective circuitry for reading. Okay? So a really important thing to take away from this is that it's not good enough to have tier one instruction that teaches via three queuing systems type work and encourages guessing and skip it and read on and look at the picture and look at the first letter, get a running start, get your mouth ready, and then send a kid off to intervention where they have explicit instruction, and then what happens? They start to do better, right? They start to do better. And then they get to that next screening cycle, and they no longer qualify for that help anymore, right? So they must be fixed. And then they no longer get that instruction, and the only instruction they're getting is back to that whole guessing piece, right? So if we are using systematic explicit instruction and a kid encounters a word that they have difficulty with, we are going to encourage them to use what they know about orthography and phonology. Remember the beginning of that processor system. 
We are not going to jump right to meaning because that's not how any of this works. <laughs> right? So then that kid is in the tier one general education classroom and is being encouraged to guess, goes off, gets explicit instruction. What happens? We end up with an intervention water cycle. The kids do better. They meet whatever the exit criteria is. They're only getting the tier one. They start to fall behind, and we're surprised. A, another screening cycle or two later, they're right back in intervention. Does that sound familiar to anybody in this room? Hands up high. Yeah, that's like basically the whole room. We shouldn't be surprised by this, right? Systematic, explicit, evidence-aligned instruction in areas of reading is not just for those kids. It's for all of our kids. So how many intervention teachers are here tonight? Keep your hands up high. How many special education teachers are here? Keep them up, all right? Hands down, how many general education classroom teachers? Okay, excellent. That message is starting to come through. Thank you, yes. Right? Because the science of reading is for all teachers. Because it's important for all kids. What's that? And psychologists are here too. And speech and language. Everybody, yes, right? But the point is, um, if, if we're sending kids off to go get evidence-aligned instruction and then they come back to their tier one instruction that's not evidence-aligned, Stephanie Finn, who I think is upstairs, uh, she calls this making scrambled eggs, right? Mixed messages. Stephen calls it making scrambled eggs. She's one of our co-founders, a dear friend and colleague of mine, all right? Uh, we have Lynn Stone in Australia who says it's like taking off your dirty clothes, having a shower, and then putting those clothes right back on. All right? So thank you, Lynn. Right? So it's not good enough to just add a layer of systematic explicit phonics on top of a tier one instructional model that is not aligned with the evidence base. That's just going to make some scrambled eggs. We need to be transformative, not additive. Right? So the Reading League's approach is to do very little with instructional change when we enter into a professional development relationship with a district for the first year. We spend a lot of time building knowledge. And when we do that, teachers start to change on their own just based on what they're learning. And then we reach a critical point where we are looking at all of our practices and saying, are they in line with what the evidence is telling us about systematic explicit instruction in each of these areas? So if a school calls us and says, we're good, we just need to know some more about phonics. We don't do that. We don't do that because we know it's just going to create that water cycle. It's going to create that scrambled eggs. It's going to be like the dirty clothes thing, right? What we want is to try to convince schools to re-educate themselves alongside us and look at all of their practices and fundamentally transform how we are approaching reading instruction all the way around. We don't just want to add a layer of phonics on top. That is not the science of reading. Oh, here we go. Here's Miss Q analysis. All right, so we'll take a look at that. I'll show you the quote that is in the Hanford, the most recent Hanford audio doc from Yetta Goodman. Uh, this is baffling. Maria and I were talking about this the day that the audio doc dropped, and 
We just can't imagine anyone's goal being to have kids make errors. Ex yes, what is a higher quality miscue? We're going to explore that idea. Okay, thank you for asking. So if you don't know about MISQ analysis, it involves this MSV stuff. And I'm going to have to come over here for a minute. You don't mind, right? Hi. All right. So we have a running record. Sometimes we have a reading record, which has the words right on it. So there are products you can buy that have the words right on it, and then the kid reads the passage, and you, cro you annotate their errors. Um, a running record is where you just have a form or you know you could do it on a cocktail napkin if you've got a lot of practice and you just make a check mark for every word that the child reads correctly and then there are different ways to denote miscues or deviations from the text the particular type of miscue that i'm talking about tonight um, is a substitution all right so these are substitutions Here's what the text is that the child was supposed to read. Veronica watched her classmates use the seesaw at recess. So if I am the examiner, I put a line above seesaw and write teeter-totter, if that's what she says. I, we can probably infer here that she looked at the picture, right? So on that page, the child has one error. That's this, right? Now, if the child went back and self-corrected that error, we'd do this. We'd, we'd say that there was a self-correction here, but we don't see any self-corrections in this example that I've given you. All right. Then we decide which queuing systems the kid was using to solve the word. So did the child look at the, sem the semantic queuing system, the meaning? Were they thinking about meaning? Do we agree that seesaw and teeter-totter are synonymous? Right? They're not the same word, but is it good enough? Sure, why not? Um, does it sound right? Yeah. Okay. What about does it look right? Well, no, these don't look anything alike. So what does that tell us about that child? that they have the habits of poor readers, <laughs> right? And that we need to dig in on the attention to print piece, right? How about this one? She wanted desperately to have a turn. Well, this gets a little fuzzier, doesn't it? So we do have one error. We have no self-corrections. Now, I'm going to say that, you know, uh, from the perspective of the logic of the three queuing systems, you could say that the child was using all three of these, right? You could say that. She wanted dreadfully to have a turn it. I mean, you kind of get it, right? Yeah. It's, it's subjective. It's debatable. But it's not like super meaning changing, right? How about, um, does it sound right? Sure, why not? It's the same part of speech, right? It's an adverb. Sounds right. It belongs there. That word could go there. And visually, yep, they're very visually, visually similar. Okay. So if I'm thinking in the logic of the three queuing systems, I'm saying that that child is using all those queuing systems. Which leaves the question, what do I do instructionally for this child? Sure. Um, let me just, um, can we get this mic so that it's on? So from this, I would come out with an instructional target. You need to read the words on the page. But I didn't teach them how to read the words. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. What's no one name? taught me. My name's Armin Spolstra. Hi, this is Armin. So back to this, which isn't nearly as compelling as Armin's story. 
Uh, what do we do instructionally for this kid? We make them a goal that says to attend a print, but then we don't teach them how the print works. Right? If you listen to the Hanford piece, you heard the talk about horse and pony, so I thought I'd throw this in there and just put it in a sentence. Okay? Here's another turn in talk. According to three queuing logic, which queuing systems are or are not being used here? Is this a higher quality miscue? What does that even mean? Why or why not? And what are the instructional implications for this child? Have at it. Horse and pony aren't the same thing. A pony's smaller. It's subjective, right? Is it meaning changing? Yeah, I don't know. But let's move on to this one. Home and house. This is going to introduce some, a little, a little bit more fog. Okay? Turn and talk. So what do we think about the house and the home? Can we say that this child was using meaning, the M? Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe not. Because what if I say a house is a physical structure, but a home is an abstract concept. Like friendship. And can friendship be a color? Oh. Mm -hmm. What about syntax or structure? Well, if you accept that they're synonyms, then yes. If you don't, then no. Very subjective. What about visual? Are we using visual? Well, we could say yes because of the H and the O at the beginning. And we could say yes because of the E at the end. But we could also say no because they're not paying a darn bit of attention to the middle of that word. It's very subjective. So what happens when we teach this way and we assess this way and we have kids being taught to guess and we have kids who have not had systematic explicit phonics instruction and we have kids who are reading books and getting older and the pictures go away and the words become more complex. This is what happens. This is what happens. And then all of a sudden, we're seeing, OK, psychologists, where are you? CSE referrals in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade for specific learning disability and reading. They've never had any problem before. But all of a sudden, those compensatory strategies are going out the window. The guessing doesn't work as much. I don't have the phonic knowledge I need to solve the words and look through them beyond the first sound and maybe the last sound because those are the, clue, the cues that I was given to use. The pictures are going away, so that doesn't help me anymore. And these words are getting longer. Right? Part of the fourth grade slump. Sometimes it's third grade, sometimes it's sixth grade. But if kids are not getting systematic explicit instruction in what they need, and they are being taught how to guess, 
and only looking at the beginning, maybe the end of words, and we don't have a scope and sequence of phonics to make sure that they fully understand how those 26 letters and 44 sounds work, this is what happens. And vocabulary factors in there too, but today I'm focusing a lot on that one area. Okay? If they're not getting systematic, explicit <laughs> instruction and vocabulary, this happens. Also, if they're reading leveled text, right? If you're kept in what's called the instructional level and not getting into sophisticated text and being able to grapple that with them with supports from a teacher, how are you learning the more sophisticated vocabulary if we say you have to stay in a level D or you have to stay in a level M, right? But that's not really what we're talking about right now. We'll move on. All right, so what does the MISQ analysis give us? It gives us a false sense of precision, right? We've got this form, we've got check marks, we can do a self-correction ratio, We can say we're analyzing cues and miscues and ostensibly to give us instructional information, but that doesn't really seem to go anywhere. And what are we going to do? Say use context more? We can, but then we're teaching compensatory strategies. and so forth, all right? Here's this other piece. If we're using these types of assessments with little ones in particular, we know that their decoding ability and their language comprehension are not commensurate. They're discrepant in the primary year. So why would we measure them with the same instrument, right? Why wouldn't we measure their code-based stuff one way and their language comprehension in another way and then know that those, if they're both receiving good attention, they will eventually marry and lead to a strong reader. Um, what I mean here is, so you've met five-year-olds that are into dinosaurs, right? Yeah, and they can talk to you about the ankylosaurus and the brontosaurus and if they're herbivores or omnivores. What am I forgetting? Herbivores. <laughs> but they can't read you books about that because they haven't been taught to read yet. So it takes a while. It takes a while for a kid's ability to get the words off the page to match their language comprehension. So why would you assess those two things with the same instrument? I don't know, what happened? So what I would propose instead, and this is very simplified, I mean we could do another two and a half hours just on this, is to start out with a normed oral reading fluency screener. If you want to know more about what that means, it doesn't mean we want kids to read really fast. It doesn't mean we want to create speed readers, right? Which seems to be a criticism of oral reading fluency measures where kids are timed for one minute and we count the number of correct words that they read. Um, if we have a normed oral reading fluency screener for kids and we understand what that means and we get the proper training in the instrument, <laughs> we can determine who may be at risk. And then if kids are flagged at risk, we know that we can look at two big pieces of reading. We can look at pro phoneme proficiency, two of the big things that get in the way of fluent, efficient, seemingly, effort seemingly effortless reading. Fluent, efficient, seemingly effortless reading. Got it that time. Right. We can give them a phoneme proficiency screener like David Kilpatrick's past 
phonological awareness screening test, which is available for free with directions online. Read the directions. Um, and we could also give something like the um, qualitative, I'm sorry, the quick phonics screener, the QPS, which is an instrument designed by Jan Hasbrook. There are others, but we want nonsense words to make sure that kids are relying on phonic knowledge to solve the words and that they haven't learned them as, as sight words. Can they apply phonic knowledge? This, uh, the QPS is broken down by syllable type, so it really helps you to zero in on a, an area to target instruction. And then it progresses to words with prefixes and suffixes, words with two syllables, three syllables, four syllables. And that really helps to inform our instruction. So instead of taking, I know Steph and I, uh, Stefan and I figured out that it can take up to 80 hours of instructional time away from a teacher doing um, four types of screening that include MISQ analysis using leveled texts in little kits mm -hmm. to get what is considered an instructional level. We can spend up to 80 hours a year doing that. This is one minute. <laughs> and then we can target some kids to look at and see what's getting in the way of that fluency. And we need to understand the relationship between fluency and comprehension, which is, again, another two hours. That's why we've got to build our knowledge, folks. <laughs> right? So these assessments are diagnostic in nature, the ones in the purple in the bottom. Right? Automaticity matters. We want things to be effortless. It's not OK to just be correct. Correct is good. But we want it to seem effortless so that we can free up that cognitive space for the other stuff, right? The critical thinking and the comprehension. This helps us to identify gaps. And then we need to provide targeted, systematic, explicit instruction in those areas. And our YouTube site is full of information about what all of this stuff means. That is a drive-by, right? Of course, if we suspect that kids have trouble with language comprehension, we will talk to our friendly local speech and language pathologist and look to them for information because they know a ton. They know a ton. They know a ton about this end, too. Um, but as far as vocabulary screeners, um, language scales, that sort of thing. Your speech and language person can be very helpful in the reading world. So please don't let them go unused. Tap into that knowledge. Okay. And on we go. Anybody heard of this? Anybody heard of guided reading? All right. A lot of things are done in the name of guided reading. A lot of things are done in the name of guided reading. If the brand of guided reading in question has kids reading leveled texts and has those three questions as the primary prompts when kids encounter difficulty with words, then that particular brand of guided reading is grounded in the three queuing systems. Right? I'm not talking about small group literature study. I'm talking about this particular brand of guided reading. Right? So I'm going to show you a study. And again, like Kilpatrick says, a lot of the studies, this is the control group, is <laughs> got a little lag here. Give me just a second. As Kilpatrick says, the control group for uh, hundreds of studies is 
whole language balance, literacy, guided reading approach, workshop model, right? The things that are most closely associated with what we would think in terms of whole language balance, literacy, three queuing systems, right? And not explicit instruction. This is just one study. Uh, I will show you. So this study was published in the Journal of Research on Educational Effectiveness in 2014. It studied second graders, and this study put up guided reading intervention against explicit instruction intervention. Right? So because a lot of things are done in the name of guided reading, this study looked to the 1996 publication from Faunus and Pinnell and where they describe guided reading and decided to stick with that. And you can find that publication. Um, it's published by Heinemann. The guided reading condition could be characterized as such. Look familiar? Now notice that when we get to the working with words, it's optional. And I'm going to read to you the notes that I have here from the study that described what might happen if working with words happened. Well, it would be one to five minutes of the intervention session. It would not be based on a scope and sequence of skills, rather it would be based on teacher observations. The instructional activities could include making and breaking words with magnetic letters, using alphabet linking charts, reading alphabet books, reading words off a word wall, manipulating onsets and rhymes, using analogies to read words, and sorting words. Here are the characteristics of the explicit instruction condition. Notice how we have decodable text up there. We have a scope and sequence up there. We have comprehension instruction using supported reading of trade books or what some might call authentic literature. Okay. So who wins? Explicit instruction always wins. Always. If you have a study where it doesn't, when it's held up against less explicit instruction, I'd love to read it. I've not encountered one yet. Okay, moving on. This goes to that visual thing. Does this look familiar to anybody? This idea of reading being a visual process. For an explainer about reading not being simply a visual process, please visit our YouTube page, and there is a video by Dr. Maria Murray uh, that goes more into this. But I just these are things that, that I see frequently, right? Uh, worksheets where kids are doing things with word shape. And if you Google word shape activity worksheets or something, like a bazillion of them pop up. Um, we see things that we can buy, commercial products that we can buy that have word shapes outlined. There's research that shows that word shape has no bearing on a kid's ability to learn to read. Right? So some folks might say, well, it doesn't hurt. And my argument is that, yeah, it's going to hurt because during the time that you're wasting on activities like this, 
you could be doing things that we know really make a difference. So it does hurt in lost instructional time. Okay. How about this one? Guess the covered word? Hands up high if you've seen guess the covered word. Yeah. Right. So guess the covered word is interesting because it says guess. I mean, it's straight up saying we're teaching this child to guess. So these are the directions. I'll walk through them with you in a moment. But in Guess the Covered Word, we see something like this. So I'll let you take a look at it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up my directions here. And this will be fun. We'll just, whoa, we'll do this together. Okay. Ask students to guess words that would make sense in the space covered in the sentence. Ready? A butterfly can. Well, no. First, you have to make a list of words that would make sense because we're starting with meaning here. What would make sense? Turn and talk. Guess words that would make sense. Okay, I'm going to bring you back. You've got some good ones. You've got some good ideas of words that would make sense. Okay. It says here, record only those suggestions that make sense. Okay, pretend I did it. Next step. Have the class check the word length by looking at the amount of space covered by sticky notes and comparing it to the visual length of the words they have guessed. Do you see the queuing systems hiding in here? Okay. Modify your list based on word length. Okay, good. <laughs> Next step says, remove the first sticky note and show the beginning letters or onset. OK. OK. So again, we're teaching kids to, when we do want them to look at the words, we're just looking at the beginning. Did you guess the covered word? Good job. All right, so in this instance, sting, right? A grasshopper can. So I want to be really clear here. The strategy is called guess the covered word and we are saying and I bought this hook, line, and sinker as a teacher. I did guess the covered word, and I did it well. <laughs> it was fun. I had my old school overhead projector, the one that blinds you, and then you get vis-a-vis -vis ink all down your arm. I totally did this. I told children that when you encounter a word that you don't know, it's basically just like it's covered up. And so guess the covered word can help us do a better job solving words that we don't know when we come to them. Because there's no difference between a word you don't know and a word that's covered up. Yes, there is. <laughs> Lots. There's plenty of information in that word about what that word is. But we need to know that as teachers in order to pass that on in our instruction to students. Right? So this, this particular passage is meant for first grade. I have to go through all the animation to get to the next one, but you can see how it works. And then the next one is a little more advanced, right? So, right? 
You get the idea? But check it out. I mean, these words are all perfectly decodable words. Why? Why are we doing this when we know the science? But it's common. There are lots of common practices that really are grounded in those three queuing systems. Here's a passage that's for fifth grade. I don't know why we have a passage that's for fifth grade. I don't know why. Especially, I don't know why we would be covering those particular words. Like a fifth grader should be able to decode those words. That shouldn't be hard. If we're doing our job before fifth grade. So, I don't know. There's another one. How about this? When you get stuck on a word, you've seen the list, we've talked about them. Turn and talk. What do they usually include? What's usually first on the list? What's usually last on the list? Go. What's usually first on the list? Look at the picture. Look at the picture, right? What's usually last on the list? Sound it out. What are some other things that might be on the list? What's that? Peep and go. Beep. Beep and go. So skip it and read on. Yep. Beep and go. That's new for me. That's my learning for the day. Beep and go. I am a lifelong learner. Beep and go. Thank you. Good. What else? Chunky monkey. Oh, yeah, there are all these animals that have found their way in. So we got chunky monkey, look for a chunk you know, right? Sometimes it's look for a word inside the word that you know. We could spend another half hour talking about examples of that too, that's fun. Um, but lots of times it is look at the first sound, get your mouth ready, get a running start, skip it, read on, go back, what would make sense, all of this, yes? Let's take a Google image search. Now I know you're not gonna be able to read this, but there are just so many of them. And if you take it and you start going through, look at the picture, look at the picture, look at the picture, <laughs> look at the picture, look at the picture, look at the picture. And then lots of, does it look right, does it sound right, does it make sense? You know, and then if you get to the very bottom, you might find sound it out. Lots of look at the first sounds, lots of look at the last sounds. There's Chunky Monkey! Right? Okay, we can, we can shut that down for now. Okay. So instead, <laughs> instead, we can tell kids to use what they've been taught. Right? We can look at our scope and sequence and say, this is what we've been taught, this is what we can use. Mm -hmm. All right, what can we do about the spread of misinformation? It's 2019. We know that folks have been speaking out against queuing systems for at least 20 years, probably longer, right? What can we do? Well, here's the first one, because you hear about it in your state-mandated anti-bullying curriculum, whatever, right? <laughs> when we see something, say something. <laughs> so that's what we did. I want to show you something that went up as a, an informational article for parents to help them with their kids when they got stuck on a word, right? I saved this in PDF format in March 2019. And if we scroll, 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 we can find, oh, down a little bit, please. Down a little bit, please, down a little bit. Instead of simply telling him to sound it out, try these tricks. Say nothing, okay, a little bit of wait time fine. Say, look at the picture. Say, let's get the first sound. Say, what would make sense? 
Do you see the three queuing systems in here? Yeah. OK. This one right here. <laughs> Close your eyes. Now remember, 20 years ago, Adams was telling us that the raw data of reading comprehension is the words. Close your eyes. <laughs> Say it like a word. I don't know. OK. So we can take that down. When this showed up on social media, folks said something. Folks who get the reading science were like, whoa, 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 whoa. That is not what we do. And the article appeared to have been taken down within a matter of days. And I went yesterday to try to see if I could find it, if it was back up, or I don't know. So this is what I found. Um, I went onto the site. I typed the author and some keywords into the search box. I found two little icons that showed the same illustration from the article. There it is. I clicked the first one. And <laughs> not found. Click the next one. Also not found. So maybe because we said something, they took it down. When I say we, I mean the folks who are advocates for evidence-aligned reading instruction. So when we see something, we need to say something. All right? Here's a th here are some things policymakers can do. Publishing companies and professional developers. I think this is the one that hurts me the most, is that people are becoming very wealthy. Peddling these materials and approaches when we know better. Schools of Ed, teacher preparation. There are reasons why sometimes faculty in schools of ed don't know about the science of reading. They might, they might just not know. But they can learn, and they can know better and do better too. I've seen it happen. School administrators, school boards. Thank you so much for coming to the Reading League tonight. Thank you.